can't believe it. We're already at our last talk for today. And that is with Robin Auer from IBM. Prior to IBM, he worked as a researcher at UBS, so another former banking colleague, yay. Um, and he's also a senior lecturer at the Constance University of Applied Sciences, and now he is a design researcher and UX designer at IBM. And obviously, AI and kind of like the whole morning was about AI, plays uh, a big role in our today's lives, but it brings a lot of possibilities like we saw earlier, but it still raises a lot of questions. There are still challenges that we have to overcome. And coming back to my qu uh, question um, earlier this morning, will we become replaceable? And I know we already got an answer, we will get another answer. Um, uh, and Robin, will actually talk about how can we create value through AI. So welcome to the stage, Robin Auer. So hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation. It's quite hard to end this day after so many amazing talks, especially with the huge question about how can we as designers can create value through AI. Uh, before I start, uh, I need to say thank you to the whole team here. It was amazing. Um, thank you to the folks behind the scenes who supported us a lot through the last few weeks. Um, and maybe we can give them a round of applause because it's not normal. <laughs> It's not normal anymore in these days that we have such events, such amazing organized events for free. Um, so, in my daily work at IBM, and is it possible to get the speaker notes or do we just have them here? The speaker notes? It's just here? The speaker notes are not there? Okay, new challenge. No worries, we can, we can get that. Um, so in my daily work at IBM, I work in data and AI. That means we are enabling customers and companies like ING, but also customers as well, um, to get AI into their daily business. And as we know as designers, generative AI and AI will change the way how we do work every day. And when we look into AI development, I need to tell you we're moving at light speed. So the last few month, not actually years, changed the game for what it means to be a designer. Um, when we look a little bit on a rough timeline, and I just tried to pull this very fast together, so, so I didn't went into the scientific discussion or anything else. I really looked only into things you can find easily on the web. 2023 was a surprising and an amazing year for the whole development around artificial intelligence. Um, The difference is that generative AI is actually what makes an impact on us, on us designers. And to understand the difference a little bit and what makes a difference, we need to look or make it dis distinguish a little bit. So discriminative AI is what we call the traditional AI. So that means that we use AI to predict, um, classify, or clustering things. And when you think about the term discrimination, it's actually more or less negative for us, right? Um, but when you try to wrap your head around it, it actually makes sense. Because why are we using it? We try to classify, as I said, or, or, or predict something. That means we are showing a machine images, it learns these images, and in the end, it defines where it fits to. So it's a duck. The new version of generative AI that makes our stomachs hurt a little bit, is the generative AI. So we give an AI or a machine some images, it learns from it, and then we give it a prompt, a text prompt, for example, or another image, and based on that, it generates new content. And this new content is what makes us struggle. In fact, AI art reached a point where it's almost indistinguishable from real photography, for example, or from real art, from recreations. So when we look here into Midjourney 5, um, we 
we create a new field of design, of art. This is basically called scientific, uh, scientific scenography is the short term of it. So it's fictional photography, you can say. And with, with Mid Journey 5, we actually figured out how to do hands rights. Like before, we had almost four, hand, uh, four fingers on hands, or three. And this model actually found a way to do faces right, fingers right. So it becomes better over time. And that's scary for us. And I see that. The problem here is that right now, when we look into business, we try to force AI into everything. And just to give you a rough number, if you, for every 20 to 50 prompts you put into JetGPT, the model chokes down 500 milliliters of water. So we need to think about how we want to use this technology in the future, even though the image f is funny. And yes, we are not thinking anymore about does it make sense to use AI in this tool? Supports it the, does it support the user? Or is it actually possible to just use a normal algorithm? Do we actually need a machine learning model? Foundation models, as we heard today um, from, from our friends from ING and from Microsoft today in the morning, is a way to decrease the effort to train a model because you have a foundation model and you fine tune this model for your specific case. That's why it's enough to use 200 pictures for the training. So in order to navigate this world as a designer, there is a way to split up AI design into three main approaches. First one is design with AI, the second one is design by AI, and the third one is design for AI. When we look into these fields, the first one is the classic one. So we use it as a tool. It helps us to speed up. It is the opportunity for us to increase efficiency. Of course, as always with new tools, and that is what we are designers kind of used to, it also gives us some sort of dependency. So we get dependent on these tools. I'm not sure how many people of you, um, when you do a layout, is not working with InDesign or Quark Express. This was a transition when these tools came in as well. When the first Macintosh was kind of um, offered to us, it was a transition in, in the scene. And the same way it will be with AI. So there is the risk of over-reliance. But I'm not sure if we need to be so worried about it. So I brought you one short video clip. And for the people in the te text behind there, it's intentionally a little bit lower down from a volume, pers volume perspective. So don't <laughs> put it up now. But I want to show you how easy it is, right? Adobe Firefly, it's so easy to, to work with it. You put a prompt into it. You made a picture for Instagram. Now you need it for full HD video. No worries. You can just create the rest through, through machine learning. Um, you want to have a 3D font that looks poppy, that looks shiny. No worries. Just type it in. You get, the, get it the way you want it. What you will get is its own kind of style, its own feeling. So we cannot avoid this, right? It gives it its own kind of AI style, if you want to say. Here's a list of tools you can use. They won't do the job for you, I promise you, but they will give you more efficiency. They will speed up the way how you work as a designer. Let's look into the second one, design by AI. And I need to say that's the one where I have a little problems with, because that means it automates design. It does the design for you. So this whole execution part around design is done by a machine learning model or by an artificial intelligence. Of course, it gives us a, lo a little bit more space and a little bit more time to focus on the idea, to go into strategic aspect of our work, to maybe bounce back and forth a little bit the ideas, and then say, here, that's the machine that's doing it. But the problem is that the stuff you're creating will always look the same. We need to keep in mind a machine learning model and an artificial intelligence takes whatever it knows, mixes it up, and is reusing these things again for new creations. There won't be anything new. It will not define new trends. It will not bring, bring something surprising to it. And that is actually what we designers are or should strive for. That's what we want to do. We want to stick out of the mess. We want to be, we, we want to be some, or we want to find new trends and be surprising with, with, with what we are creating. I have a, one example here for you as well. Um, again, the volume um, is a little bit low, so I can talk a little bit to it, because it's basically an, an, an AI app that does the coding for you. So if you have an idea for an app, you use prompt to type it in, and it creates the whole code and everything for you. 
functions. You, use it, you need a new functionality, no worries. Go in, type in what functionality is, and ta-da, the app is ready for you to use. But as I said, it works based on patterns. So all apps that this tool will kind of throw out will be exactly the same as it did for another person. So we won't create anything new. I have a list of tools I was even thinking about not putting it in here, but this is a, this is a list of tools for how I would call you if you use a lazy designers. Um, I think these tools are for people who are not coming out of design, who want to get fast to new solutions. We know these website builders from different providers here in Germany, um, but in, in other countries as well. Um, but these tools were created for people that are non-designers. So let's look a little bit into the third one, design for AI. And I would love to talk a little bit more details about this one, because that's my home base. That's where I'm coming from. That's what I'm doing every day at IBM. I create tools that have some sort of AI capabilities, and I want others to use it and to feel comfortable with it. And we are currently developing a solution at IBM that's called Watson X. It's a platform solution for, for customers. Um, that should enable customers to use different kind of foundation models to train them for other purposes, as we, as said, as we heard. Um, this platform consists out of three tools. One is for data management, the other one is for um, training AI, and the third one is for data governance. So the tool you see here is a tool that is used to um, monitor machine learning models and um, gives you different metrics for bias, um, accuracy, and raises an alarm if a model changes a behavior in a way it shouldn't. That is the foundation for every company out there to use AI. They need to, need to have some guardrails. And that is what we hope to do with this tool. We as designers, when we think about design for AI, we need to understand that being a designer in this field changes the way how we design and for what we design. Because Suddenly, we are designing for systems that can understand, reason, and learn, and interact on its own. And I think we are moving from designing transactions into designing relationships. And I want to explain that a little bit more in detail. Who of you know what that is? Just put up your hand very quick. Wow, that's, that's a small amount of people. OK, it's a punch card. I'm not sure if you have ever seen something like that or used it. That's the benefit of working for a company that's as old as IBM is. We can play around with these machines that are still existing. Um, it's a punch card. And whenever someone used in the past a punch card, um, they had to learn how to use it. But even more training had to be done in order to understand how to read it and how to make sense out of it. So what I try to explain here is we had to learn how to communicate and how to work with these machines. And when we look into the history of um, graphical or, or human interaction, then we see that everything started with command lines, um, with business machines. Like, it was a black screen with white font, and we had to type in queries. After that, we, we continued to personal computers with graphical user interfaces where we had icons where we were able to move it around. Third one, um, now it's natural user interfaces, where we have a touch screen where we actually can really interact with an, with an interface. And last but not least, it's artificial intelligence. It's a way to, to design conversations. Suddenly, the conversation and the, the, the AI is our interface. So what I try to say is, for the last 75 years, we have been communicating with computers on their terms. Now, we have to find a way so that machines can communicate with our terms. That is the change. And that is what I mean when I say we're moving from transactional, or transactions that we design, to relationships that we design. If we want to understand how a relationship can be designed, we need to first understand how we as humans create relationships to each other. So there is an amazing model called Knapp's Relationship Model. Knapp is a professor at the UT in Austin, um, Texas, that shows or very in a formal way how humans 
build up relationships. And it shows how people come together. It shows how you kind of hold a relationship and how you come, come apart. For the sake of what we want to do, we can look into the left side of the coming together side. So when we, as I said, when we kind of use this model to see how humans come together, we have the initiative phase where we say we have first impression and judgment. It's people coming together saying, hello, how are you? The sec second one is experimenting. So we're testing where we have commonalities, for example. So we search for patterns. We say, oh, I heard you play soccer. I play soccer as well. What's your favorite team? The third one is intensifying. That means we share personal information. The fourth one is integrating. You're starting to integrate someone into our life. And the fourth one is bonding. Like we try to fully partner up. Maybe we propose to someone. Maybe we become a couple. Now let's try to see how this could work with the machine. If we say we are mapping this as a UX pattern to a machine, and we could say the initiating phase is that we test out the first kind of system's tone and personality. So I think you, all of you uh, used Ziri and um, heard maybe a, a hey, we, how are you? Or a welcome. My name is Ziri, or my name is Alexa. So a quick introduction. Second one is experimenting. I'm not sure who of you ever asked Alexa to, or, or Ziri to tell you a joke. There you go. That is experimenting. We try to get a feeling for the intensity of the tool. We try to test it, test it to see how far we can go. And we are intensifying it. That means we are expecting that the system knows about things we already told them, the system. Then we are integrating things into our life. We are kind of woken up, or it wakes up in the morning, gives us a reminder when to order a taxi. It maybe gives us a, remi a reminder about the birthday of your mom. So it, it becomes kind of an integral part of your life. Bonding? It's hard. I've never seen an AI really bo to bond with a human. I'm not sure if some of you know Replica AI as a tool. It's super scary. I wouldn't use it. I've just seen videos of it. I'm a little bit scared of Replica AI because I feel like it has the intention to bond with a human. But how it really looks like, we don't know. I would love to show you one example, and it's a, if you want to say, kind of a, an, a prototype out of, out of an IBM garage uh, project, call for code called, um, to show you how a, an AI system can help a human to become better in the job without overruling this person. It's called AI um, emergency control room. Let me set the stage very quick. It's about an emergency uh, control room. Um, and in specific situations where you have, for example, a, a lot of emergencies coming in at the same time, and you need to understand um, what of the emergency calls actually fit together and belong together, because we have the issue that in such situations, we often sh uh, send out multiple teams to the same emergency. And we try to find a solution for it. Howard County 911, we missed a call from you? Yes, I have a lady stuck in a building over here across the street for with from me. What's it? one forty one and the water's getting higher and higher on her. Okay, what's the name of that business? It's called C I V A Z Boutique. It's eighty one forty one Main Street. Alright, look. Stay with me, okay, Sam? Okay, okay. Is she on the first floor? Tell me. She's on the first floor. She's right now standing on top of her counter screaming.
Hurricane Owen. Um, hi, I was just on the phone with my friend. She's at 8141 Main Street, Ellicott City. Okay, is this the Adiva's boutique? Yeah, yeah, she has she called. Okay, is she able to get out at all? No. Okay, I have the call in for dispatch, okay? Okay. Okay, we're. I'm going to get help to her as soon as we can, okay? Okay, thank all you. Right, thank you. Bye, right, bye. Bye. I know it doesn't look like a very impressive example, but it shows you how an AI and a machine learning tool can help you to improve efficiency in situations where it's needed. There are two main capabilities in here. The first one is um, speech to text, like we are translating what people say into a text form. And the second one is um, natural language processing. So that whatever accent, dialect, so I'm obviously German, I'm not from the US or not from the UK, so English is not my first language, but um, to get these actually into a text form, you need to have a model that learns dialects and accents. So that's, that's behind that. Um, that's it. It's simple, it's easy, it's efficient. That is what AI is good for. So when we design AI systems at IBM, we try to see the human and the machine always in a context. That is important for us. But there are two more elements that we need to consider. The first one is what we say the world. The world is for us represented by the data and the regulations we have in order to use this data, but also the model. And the second one is the business. And the business is represented by the company we're working for or by the user's needs we're, we're working for. So if you would now love to learn more about IBM and how we use um, AI in our tools, and especially how we design AI systems. This one is an essential course for AI that all of the employees at IBM need to go through to understand what are the tools we want to use to kind of develop an AI system, but also what it means to use it in an ethical way. So we have here gate, um, guardrails in the process again that says, okay, we need to qu kind of question ourselves. Is that a system we want to work? Is it a system we have the data for? And can we actually use the data? All these questions need to be asked before you create a new AI system. So let me close with um, three things. As designers who are confronted with generative AI, we need to understand that AI is a tool. It should not take over the work for you. And for me, it goes down or it boils down to kind of a, an expectation on yourself and on your work. You want to be better of what is out there. You want to be better on the stuff that's on Dribbble, on Pinterest, and somewhere. And if you want to be better than that, you cannot rely on the AI um, to do your job. Number two, AI can automate tasks for you. It can make you more efficient. And we heard it today already a few times. Um, use AI in order to speed up certain things. When I started my first internship at an advertisement agency, they asked me to, to get out the background of a wooden, I think, slattered frame is, I think, the English term. So it's a very tedious task that takes you, for, and takes you a while to finish. But it was a test. It was a test to see how fast I am and how, how, how carefully I am. And in a days for AI, no problem anymore. It, it will do it for you. And last but not least, AI is not perfect. And it will take as long until it is perfect. So one essential thing for everything you do with AI, but also when you design something with AI, is human oversight. We need to have a human in control of what we are doing. Not because. I want to be in charge of everything. That's not the point. We don't know if, a, if the AI works accurately, and we don't know what an AI is creating. And human oversight gives you the feeling of control and trust into the system. And the goal needs to be that we generate 
as many as possible success moments with an AI tool so you start to get comfortable with it. Imagine or remember the steps experimenting. Experimenting is just about success moments. If you can generate success moments with an AI tool, people will trust you or the system and will start and continue to use it. With that, Sebastian, and <laughs> back to you. Thank you. Well, I, I won't let you go uh, right now. You have to have a little discussion with me first. But uh, first of all, thank you, Robin. Again, really, really, really inspiring. Um, want to take a seat? Yeah, go sure. ahead. I follow you. <laughs> so the first question, obviously, will we be replaced. <laughs> I know it's like it's it keeps coming up in my mind all day, and I hope uh, I can solve this once uh, for good. But yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> if I want to be replaced, or if you're lazy. Oh, okay. Then if you, if you rely <laughs> if you rely on AI tools for what you do, and really it becomes kind of normal for you, yes, you will be replaced. So I guess the the last takeaway that you had, like AI is a tool, but it's use it, make use of it, but don't like let it do all your work. Exactly. You will be replaced because your customers will find tools to do the same job. Yeah, they, they, they can just use the AI tool. Exactly. If I can use it, they probably can use it. Exactly. But sometimes not. But, uh, OK, that's good to hear. So hopefully you, we you still have You just need to look into the crowd again. I need to ask how many customers already sent them kind of Photoshop files or something like that, or they said, oh, I got InDesign, and I tried yeah, to... Yeah, I'm a designer my... now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> we and all heard that. That's the same thing <laughs> that will happen again. And a really interesting thing, and, um, and I, was, I, was, I was thinking about the um, like Instagram thing challenges where you actually can like, um, upload a photo of you, and then you have like, you in a high school, like those high school photos. I've, I'm sure you, you saw that. Um, I was uh, then I was like kind of intrigued. Oh yeah, I want to do that too. And then I was like, oh yeah, but actually, where is this this photo uploaded, and how are they going to use it, and and all those things that that come with it. And what do you think? Like, how can we make sure that users can trust those AI systems, and yeah, so that they are using it with without the fear that whoever wants in the end can take their pictures or something like that? So there are so many things in there to kind of, um, fo kind of bring up. Um, first of all, there are many, many initiatives going on right now with the EU AI Act that will definitely set a foundation for this as well. Second, you should be aware of where you upload your pictures. <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, often, I, I teach at my university, and there, there are so many students, and I always kind of make them aware of what they do with their documentation, I want to say. Because if I upload my project to Behance, I'm not sure, I think we all know Behance belongs to Adobe, I'm not sure what Adobe will do with it one day. I don't want to say that they are doing anything with them. If you actually check their, um, their, their documentation around Firefly and something like that, they promise they haven't used Behance or Adobe Cloud Images for training. Um, but we don't know. So make sure you know where to upload your pictures. And um, something I also always try to say is, yes, AI is a system that learns. As long as we upload things to the internet and show it to, to, the, to the public audience, um, it, there is still the opportunity or possibility that someone takes it and trains a model with it. Um, we hope that we get, get some legal guardrails um, from the European Union, um, but we don't know what other people are doing with, with, with the things we, we have or tools we have. And we have a per uh, perfect question for that from the audience. Um, the hype around AI will affect all industries, including ours. So regulations will play a key role. How do you see the near future? I was always a little bit afraid that regulations slow down innovation. Um, and I still think that's the case. 
I'm scared of the fact that designers and illustrators and many other associations were asking for a break because that's nonsense. That will not happen. Um, I'm less afraid that we will not have good regulations soon because I work a lot in the area of AI governance and um, AI regulations. I'm not a, a, a lawyer or a legal person, so but I need to understand somehow a little bit what the EU is planning for our AI governance toolings. I'm more afraid of the, 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 the countries, the companies, and, and, and so on out there who just don't, don't care. care. Don't care, yeah. And a really good second question here is, do you think that companies who restrict the use of AI because of data protection concerns or legal concerns also will be outperformed by competitors? I think companies who are not using AI will be somehow. Because Overall. Overall, okay. because I think companies who are using machine learning models and, and AI and gen AI will become faster in things. Um, I don't think people who stick to regulations um, will be outperformed. Um, the reason is because the companies we, we, we are kind of get in touch with every day um, mostly have already their own AI ethics. The difference is right now they, it's, it's on them to um, act based on these AI ethics. In the future, there will be clear regulations. And the regulations, I think, will not change a lot in the way how you use it. It's more about how the way how you can prove mm -hmm. that you use it in the right way. So there's a lot of, or the regulations will contain a lot around documentation. What is the accuracy metric you need to f um, follow? Um, how do you measure accuracy? Because the, all these terms are not well defined. Interesting. And that's, that's a also a really nice question and kind of cute. So what, are <laughs> so what are, in your opinion, the top three talks, uh, tasks that AI will optimize in the next two years? And also, thank you for the great insights. That's cute, right? <laughs> thank you. Uh, the top three tasks AI will take over. Um, for designers, definitely um, everything around image creation. Um, as I said, making images fit the purpose you want to have it. Um, there's no need anymore to, to think about the way how you, you want to use an image when you take the image. Um, you just take the, 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 the picture and, and do it. Uh, the editing of images, creating, um, I'm sure you have seen this, um, these, these shoes and patterns and product design were probably, uh, were, were out of nothing patterns are created you would never have thought of. Mm -hmm. And these patterns are so inno innovative and they, they work. You can put them on shoes and they are just amazing. I think that is an area. And if I can bring something up that's far away from design but is a huge hope of mine is in um, medical things. I mean, helping with um, vaccines for cancer, something like this. That's something my one of my big hopes. And I'm always... Something I'm thinking a lot about is when will the day come we combine a quantum computer with an AI? <laughs> if that happens, I'm not sure what happens then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, another question is on ethics. Um, can you name some of the IBM principles here? So one of the principles I, I, I already told is human oversight, like human needs to be in control. Um, we always say that the person, like we stay the owner of the data. Um, I said, you cannot just take images and, and, and start to train a model with it. Um, the other one are, who feels like an exam now. <laughs> um, <laughs> it shouldn't be. <laughs> um, the other one, like human control, um, data ownership responsibility um, that we as the people who are creating the tool are accountable for the tool. It's, it's not that we are accountable from a legal perspective, but it's on us what we are creating. Um, I think these are the three main ones. We have five in total. Please don't ask me for the other two. <laughs> I want, I want. <laughs> um, another question here is, what makes you think that in real, the human brain works so differently than AI principles? Repeat that one, please. What makes you think that the human brain works so differently than AI principles? I don't think they work so differently. Um, I just, the major difference I always see is that 
and the AI is always trained uh, for a specific use case. We still struggle to contain knowledge in a model. Um, and we can use it, we can use it in the model for this specific use case, and we need to keep in mind that a model always works based on the data you gave it. So if something changes, if you need to retrain it. And just for you as information, to retrain a model, you need to invest millions. It's not a little bit of money you invest. It's not a, a little bit fine tuning or something. If you want to really retrain a model, like JatGPT, it's about $4 million. And the only GPUs you can use for training currently are GPUs from NVIDIA. These GPUs were never made for AI training. They were made for 3D gaming. But they are the most efficient and easy to use one. One of these GPUs costs about $10,000. For training JetGPT, uh, not JetGPT, to creating the um, model from Meta, Meta, you had to use 2,408 of these GPUs. Just to give you a little bit of relationship, what it means to train such a foundational model. Next question is, and maybe that's more for the UX designers here, which workflows you see AI can help a lot in UX research? Oof, I hope. <laughs> uh, like, it, it helps us already with transcriptions. Um, I hope it will take over coding. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> uh -oh. get rid of coding. Um, we, we actually have our own initiative um, at IBM who looks into ways how Gen AI can take over as much as possible from a user research perspective. I'm not sure, I forgot the name to be honest, but there is a tool that wants to automate the whole user research process and <laughs> it just gets out of my way to kind of envision this, uh, how this would look like, but I, I like the human touch in user research. Okay, now I sound so conservative. <laughs> but that, I, for user research, I want to be in front of a person and talk to them and want to see their impressions and yes. everything. So. Uh, somehow, I, because I ask that question myself, it's like I always think that in an interview situation, for example, where you, where you test something, there's so much that you learn from, not from the things said, but from the things not said and like, like how, how they use the application or whatever you're testing. So. Um, and I always think, okay, when an AI or a computer, whatever, sees that, I'm in trouble. But as long <laughs> as they don't, um, because I feel like that is exactly that, that human touch mm -hmm. that, is, that is needed in those things. You know, a good as a researcher, when you do in context for inquiry and you're sitting next to a customer and you, you look a little bit what the customer is doing with an interface and how, it, how, how he or she is using it, um, a great user researcher understands what the customer is doing. An amazing user researcher recognizes the little sticky note underneath of the display with a password on it, and that <laughs> gives you the indicator what the user actually needs. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, we got a lot of these, uh, but yeah. Uh, another question is, do you think AI should be trained and used to make moral decisions? For instance, which lives to, uh, to be saved or priorities in an accident scenario? No. Okay, cool. Next question. <laughs> no, is <there's> anything? <laughs> no, because I said we, we, we never, like, maybe no, not today, um, to be honest. Um, we all feel not the way that we can trust these systems. And I, I need to take an example from Angel um, today with the 3D character. It gives you, when it communicates with you, it gives you the feeling that it understands you and it responds to you, but it feels not natural. It feels not like I could build up a relationship with this person because it's saying like, I want to just sit down. Okay, let's sit down. Like it's repeating things I'm saying. It wants to feel you comfortable. It wants to feel you cozy, but it will never give you kind of a response that is maybe not expected. It will never surprise you and that's why. As far as we are not reaching the point that I really can trust the system, through the relationship model I showed you, I don't think it will happen. That's why no. That's interesting because um, I've been in, in San Francisco this year and uh, tried one of those cars. I think they're now uh, not in not running anymore. But I, I, I thought because right now shouldn't there? Uh, I thought how do they deal with those situations? Because there is traffic, there is people out there. It's like you don't know what people are doing and. 
I was wondering on, on what the decision would be, and then I saw we were stopping at the at the traffic light, and there was just an orange blink, and the car couldn't couldn't turn because it couldn't understand that it's not going red or red or green. So we just stayed there for like 10 minutes. Nothing was happening. I was like, that's it. So, and then on the same hand, I was like, maybe as you, the way you think is like, maybe it's not the best idea to give them that at yeah. the moment, so. It's, it's funny because whenever we are able to prank an AI, we are super happy. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> well, we're I, super I, lucky. I, of, uh, I thought with a, with a car, the traffic light is not a prank, but uh, sure. uh, yeah. If you, if you want to do it, like just open up ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT about um, like the mother or the father of a, of a, like a, like a, like a famous person, whoever you want. And JetGPT will be able to answer you that. But if you do it the other way around, if you open then a new window in JetGPT, so start from scratch, right? And ask JetGPT who is the famous son or the famous daughter of the specific person you just figured out, it won't They're be confused. able to tell you. <laughs> so it's not working the other way around. That's super interesting because I, I remember the first time Siri came out and you, you could ask all those questions and I had like little jokes and like little Easter eggs and it was like, oh my God, this is the future. It's amazing. And now we, we, we came to, to all of the other tools and it was like, oh, that was just the start. So yeah, and also, like, for example, if you sit down, if you sit in a car, um, you usually want to ask simple things like you want to ask, what can I do with you? And then you want to hear some options um, and not some sounds like, oh, I didn't get that. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat it? Or something like this. And maybe one last question. Um, I love what uh, that you said, AI is just a tool. I think that it really opens up imagination. People who would not be able to use a tool now can. So I think that's uh, referring to the, to the app building. Mm -hmm. And what would you like to do with AI in a skill you don't have? Skill I don't have. So many skills. Well, what skill don't I have? <laughs> There are so many skills I don't have. Speaking co like Mandarin, for example, difficult languages. I think that is something um, I would love to be taken over by an AI that I can just talk with any person in the world. Um, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, learning things faster. Like I'm a super slow learner. Like I can remember things when I talk to a customer and user like that's what makes me survive. Um, <laughs> but uh, like learning things really well so that I can that's why I was asking for my speaker notes. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, uh, you you've done great. It's like we didn't notice. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. That's it. Time's up. Again, a big applause for Robin Owl. Thank you.